Hello my tricks and friends. Um, I hope this finds you um, within reasonable time while you're preparing for your media exams, those who are still writing. And those that have written this paper, uh, this is the supplementary paper that was written for May, June uh, exams. And it's a national paper, meaning it's written all over the country. So it should be the same. Um, I got this paper from this website stanmorephysics.com for someone who wants a copy of course I do have a copy if you need one I can share it with you or you can just go to this site you'll be able to download both the physics um, paper as in of course this is the same let's just say physics but uh, paper one and paper two all right um, for that mathematical Math mathematics paper goodness I don't know what's wrong with me but it's very late anyway I'm very fried sorry guys I wanted to post this much earlier but uh, I didn't find time and I'm just forcing it now so that at least you have it in time so I hope I won't give you something inferior uh, I hope it will maintain at least the standard of what I've been giving so far of course I'm hoping to improve and do better um, some of you have suggested that I uh, should do some more, you know, artillery in the way of uh, giving you this video so you can zoom in into some chapters. I'm not that very computer literate, but I will do it. I've seen how it's done. So slowly but surely I'm getting there. So in no time you're going to have pretty much the best of what you need and exactly how you want it. So just bear with me for a second on this current moment. but. I will try and get that addressed so that yeah, you can be able to view some chapters that you prefer so that you don't get to be you know dragged along these very long lengthy videos I make here other than that uh, those who wrote so let's have a look and see what you guys had and those who are still to write please let's have a look together so that you can measure how far you need to still go or how much you already have you know under control okay guys uh, that one what did I say that mathematics paper is the site is what it's SA exam papers so it's one word SA exam papers dot co dot za so you'll get the mathematics paper there or drop me either your whatsapp number or your email address uh, trust me, I know there are some issues, some people really want these papers, but I guess they're afraid of probably some sort of, you know, criminal activities. Ah, I can tell I'm not a criminal. <laughs> I would never be one, not in a single day. Uh, but I don't mean to say trust me, but I definitely would promise I would never do anything rather than what we're doing here, which is to share information so that we can help each other to get better and better at this subject. All right, with that being said, let's have a look at this paper here. So as you say, it's downloaded from stanmorephysics.com. All right, so let's have a look at these questions. So I'm not going to try and read too much of the details of what, of, uh, yeah, whatever that is. <laughs> Now I'm really losing my focus guys, I'm sorry for that, but let's just have a look quickly. So some of these papers are branded heavily, so some areas are going to be hidden, so I just hope you'll be able to see them. Now let's have a look here. Various options are provided as possible answers to the following questions. Each question has only one correct answer. Choose the answer and write only the letter next to the, I mean, next to the question numbers. So there's the demonstration there for you. Now let's look at 1.1. It says which one of the following compounds has the lowest melting point? Um, lowest melting point, okay? That means at a very low temperature, it's already melting, meaning from solid to liquid, okay? So let's have a look. So what do we expect to melt at a very low temperature? It's those small chain uh, hydrocarbons, isn't it? So let's have a look here. Hexane. Okay, maybe. Ethane. 
ethane is two carbons, hexane is five. So these are essentially, again, if you look at these ones, these are alkanes. So we know that the smaller chain alkanes or shorter chain alkanes will be the ones with a lowest melting point. So octane is much bigger than hexane. Butane is bigger than ethane, so ethane should be the one, right? So this one is pretty easy, so it's a bit of a standard question. So this one will have a low melting point, as well as its boiling point is going to be low, all right, compared to the others. All right, not a problem. So first two marks in the bag over there. So let's have a look at the next one. Um, it says now, when this one, what is that? There's two carbons, so there's a double bond, so it's a saturate it's an unsaturated hydrocarbon with two carbons, and we can see that this is an alkene. Okay. Now this is converted to CH3 CH3, which is essentially ethane. And ethane is what we're talking about above. So it says now the type of reaction is now remember we're converting this an alkene into an alkane. So we simply add hydrogen. So is it hydration? Hydration is when you add water. Hydrolysis is when you also react this with water or some um, hydroxide containing compounds. Then halogenation is when you're actually adding a halogen. So this is hydrogenation because we're adding only hydrogen. So it's an addition reaction. It's funny though because they said the type of reaction. When they say type, it should be either elimination, um, substitution, or addition, things like that. Then the name of that reaction would be hydrogenation when you're getting hydrogen added. Could be hydrohalogenation if you're getting a hydro, hydrogen halide, or you would call it. Um, yeah, you name, you name whatever you'd be doing, but here's the thing. To say the type, the type is actually an addition reaction, okay? But the name of that addition reaction is hydrogenation, so it's not a very good way of phrasing that question because they should have said the name of the reaction at least. Or even say the name of the addition reaction at least, and you would know you're looking for a specific name of what exact compound are you adding. In any case, you always look at the options, they will give you the guide. Sometimes you cannot really ask for these guys to be perfect, I mean they are human, so some things, you know, the thought is to really bring it out such that there are no controversies about it, but sometimes it just doesn't happen, so I wouldn't claim to be perfect myself. Alright, so let's have a look at the next one. So second mark in the bag over there. <clears throat> Which one of the following compounds in solution? Now remember this one is in solution. Okay. And usually we use water here. Okay, say so an aqueous solution. But sometimes we know that these organic compounds, some are nonpolar, so they will dissolve better in nonpolar compounds or some nonpolar solvents. But once they say in solution and not state which one, always assume it's water, okay? Now, we'll change the color of bromothymol blue. So what is bromothymol blue? It's an indicator. And bromothymol blue is blue in a basic solution and it turns red in a uh, <clears throat> acidic solution. All right, so that is cool. Or does it turn pink or red, but whatever, man. Changes color, though, to something pinkish or reddish, yeah. Let's leave it at that. Sometimes I forget, okay? Don't forget that I am a little bit, you know, far away from these things, but I'm dragging them back, okay? For your benefit. And please advise if there's any errors that I'm presenting, because my intention is not to do damage, but to do good. So I hope you will not let me mislead you. You will let me know when I am misleading you because I still have that much of a capability to do so. But I will do my best 
to keep that in check okay hey, enough of the talking time is ticking so what will change the color of bromothymol blue so we know this is an indicator of course it's blue in a basic uh, solution turns pink in a acidic solution so let's have a look now what is that one two three so there's three carbons so this is prop but now once you have that CHO at the end, you know that this signifies an aldehyde, okay? So when it's like that, it tells you you're dealing with an aldehyde. And always the carbonyl group in the aldehydes is put at the very end. So they are never put elsewhere. Otherwise, it becomes a problem. Remember, aldehydes and ketones, they have the carbonyl group. But the difference between the two is that the ketones, the carbonyl group is, the carbon which makes the carbonyl group is bonded to two other carbons. But with aldehydes, it's bonded to just one carbon and a hydrogen. So that's why you, you will never have an aldehyde where this carbonyl group is put elsewhere. If it is put elsewhere, just know you're not dealing with an aldehyde in a condensed structural formula like that. All right, so this is an aldehyde, which is propanal, because it's like propane, but the suffix, because it's an aldehyde, is propanal. So propanal, well, does it really change a bromothermal blue in solution? Nah, not really, because here we're talking about acid versus basic. Yes, these are some kind of weak acids of some sort, but they do not function as acids because remember Laura Bronsted and Arrhenius model of acids and bases is that a base accepts a hydrogen and an acid donates a hydrogen or a base liberates hydroxide groups in solution or um, an acid liberates hydrogen ions in a solution so this cannot be so what about this one one two three so there's three but there's this COOH. So once you see this, it's a pity now there is this uh, branding here. But this is CH3, CH2, COOH. Once you see that cool kind of a thing there, you know that you're dealing with a carboxylic acid. So that's a carboxylic group at the end over there. So there's how many carbons there? One, two, three. So this is propanoic acid. Okay. There's that suffix or ick. All right, so an acid, yes, definitely. It's a weak acid, yes, but what will it do in solution to liberate hydrogen ions? Yes, it does dissociate incompletely, but it will change the color of promethymol blue because it won't be basic anymore, so it's going to be acidic. So yes, B is the best one. What is this one? One, two, three, four. There's four carbons here, and once you see COC, once you see this in any condensed structural formula, you know that you are dealing with ketones. Okay, so this is butan one own because this carbon uh, that bears, uh, sorry, carbon two own, you never have one own because remember, if it is here, it would become an aldehyde, so you can't have a one own. So it starts with two and more, right? So this one, uh, this is uh, what, and in fact, the smallest is proper known. So this is one, two, three, four. So this is butan two own. So it's a ketone. So a ketone, it's a weak acid, of course, as well of some sort. But look, it doesn't behave as an acid or a base, according to the Laurie Bronsted model or the Arrhenius model of acids and bases. So we leave it out, okay? And then what about this one? C O whatever one two three four again there's four but once you see this double O let's just say C double O C like that you know that you're dealing with esters okay so that would be a methyl propanoate okay so it's fine again esters ah we know they give flavors to foods and fruits and stuff like that and we know that of course aldehydes and ketones mainly aldehydes they give sort of like the smells of plants and stuff like the distinctive smells of plants 
but fruits we tend to know the difference bananas and all that because of this esters that are there and ketones yeah they're in there you know there's a condition diabetic ketoacidosis you can even smell uh, those ketones uh, in that person when they have that acidosis in any case we're not there uh, so basically the best answer here is a carboxylic acid because that one we define it as an acid as opposed to the others okay so i would say b is the best choice for 1.3 okay uh, no problem so let's have a look at this next one 1.4 it says two different samples of impure calcium carbonate do you see this question is coming back we had a question on impure calcium carbonate um, on the longer questions was it longer questions no it was mcqs in the last november exams so you see some questions that have a tendency to be brought back but in a different form sort of so always try to think beyond what you already are seeing because chances of seeing it directly the same way are much smaller but that can be transformed a little bit further than you know the way they asked it so be able to explore around those questions now it says uh, two different samples of impure calcium carbonate of equal masses react with 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed of sulfuric acid assume that the impurities do not react again these are very important key words so always make sure you understand what is being provided to you so when you're saying the impurities do not react so that means it has something to do with the quantity of the reactants as well as the quantity of the products that we can get which is what is called the yield so it says now the graph below shows the volume of carbon dioxide gas produced for each reaction so you see the yield of carbon dioxide gas of course volume has something to do with number of moles in terms of gases because we know that we take the molar gas volume at stp and we can actually determine the number of moles by just knowing the volume of a gas or a real gas sort of so let's not go to let's not go there and complicate our lives but all we know is that this calcium carbonate we know that metal carbonates when they react with acids they form three things it's a salt they form water and carbon dioxide so you always know that if you were to picture or they would say write a balanced equation which was the famous question during our metric year you would be given words even you would not even be given this formula you needed to know how to get this thing right by knowing oxidation numbers and mastering a periodic table and how these compounds actually react together in this predictable manner then you would have to think about what products would I get when I combine a metal carbonate and an acid it doesn't matter which one I'm gonna get carbon dioxide water and a salt okay now what is that situation that you would get here carbon dioxide is one of them so they chose it so let's have a look I'm already prolonging this I don't want to you know volume of carbon dioxide you can see for reaction one the total volume there let's just look at the plateaus okay because the plateaus are telling you that is the maximum volume that we could get assuming that the reactions uh, reached uh, what is that state again yeah whatever that is called so they reached their end point I would use just simple English at this point but there was a word if I'm not mistaken that describes that very end of the reaction so in any case you can tell that the maximum volume once the re this reaction has really reached its uh, its end okay I forgot this term now um, it's much smaller than in reaction 2 so what does it tell you already right, tells you that the amount of this impure calcium carbonate is unequal this one should have more because the more you have you know the more you're going to produce okay so that is exactly what we took because these ones were of equal masses again you, you pay attention to that that these impure samples 
they were actually of equal masses and for us to obtain different amounts of products it already tells us that the other sample was much purer than the other one okay because we are told that the impurities do not react so let's see what is the question it says now which compound sorry when compared to reaction two when compared to reaction two what are we comparing to reaction two it's reaction one which one of the following statements best explains the curve obtained for reaction one the temperature is higher in reaction one well it doesn't really make sense so we know that acid base reactions are purely exothermic so they release energy so they are pretty spontaneous you don't need to even use temperature or anything so temperature does not favor the exothermic reaction which is the forward reaction so the forward reaction here is exothermic so if you getting a higher temperature will be favoring the reverse reaction in a way it wants to suggest that but nah it doesn't make that much sense it can't be it just cannot be um, what else can we say here the surface area is greater in reaction two. well surface area just makes the reaction faster but it doesn't say anything about uh, the product that you're going to get so we know that the surface area concentration and to some extent temperature in this case may just affect the reaction rate how fast you're getting what you're getting but the amount that you are getting will depend on the amount of the reactants so that doesn't really say too much so already a b uh, is out the amount of impurities is greater in two it can't be because impurities do not react so if they don't react why would we get more so also C is out okay so what is the story here it already tells us that D is true because now it says the amount of impurities is greater in reaction one that is true because in reaction one for us to get a smaller amount of the product it means for the same mass there was more of what does not react compared to an equal mass of what was used in reaction two so Again, you need to be able to understand a bit more than, you know, that is given. So this is why you guys, when you study, please buffet to make a habit of always reading your books so well that when you open those books again, you feel bored because you already know what is where. And try every time you're getting a question to try and remember as much as you can without answering anything. Try and remember as much as you can and again when you see a memorandum or some solution try to reason beyond just that solution and see if what you already know ties up with what is being proposed as the answer because some answers actually stand to be corrected later on because they are quite controversial but because there's nothing much now to contest them we tend to accept them as true all right so again this question felt a bit silly when I was reading it, but yeah, once you start to know what you, 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 you're you dealing with and what you're doing, because I mean, remember, if we're saying here temperatures, are, that means we're favoring the reverse reaction. In a way, uh, come on, let's not go there. Anyway, I think this is the best answer and let's not complicate our lives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so let's go to 1.5. Uh, it says the equation below represents a hypothetical reaction. Okay, hypothetical. As you can see, there are no specific compounds being put. But once the enthalpy of the forward reaction, this is called enthalpy or the heat of the reaction. Once it's negative, we know this is an exothermic reaction. Okay, that means it liberates heat. If you were to write properly this one, you'd have to balance this one by writing this triangular stuff delta which means there's a heat there okay not a problem so once we know the forward reaction is negative in terms of energy this is the energy of the products so we know that this is an exothermic reaction so now it says the activation energy of the reverse reaction is 110 kilojoules per mole hmm activation energy of the reverse reaction uh, what are you talking about you guys 
you are trying to kill us so okay fine you can take the death sentence we don't mind um what is the story now it says which one of the following is the activation energy in kilojoules per mole for the forward reaction is it 50 is it 60 is it 110 which is the same one is it that same one or is it 160 even more well there is a bit of a situation here there's no easy way of looking at this uh, I find that the best way to answer this question is to consider those graphs you need to know what an exothermic um, uh, graph or energy graph looks like sometimes they call it potential energy graphs or whatever so I think that one answers it best than to just think about it because it's a bit of a situation it doesn't really make much sense when you just attack it without considering this so now let's imagine we have our heat right okay so this is zero over here so we're going to have here the energy okay whatever energy is we say potential energy EP in kilojoules per mole all right so for an exothermic reaction because we know this is exothermic that means the energy of the products remember the products will come here and then active energy activation energy comes in to take these ones into that activated complex and then when product starts forming they lose that heat because as they complex they release the energy that they had from this one so the energy of the products is usually lower than the energy of the reactants so let's say that is the energy of the reactants we know these are the reactants that's the activated complex and that's the products okay so what is the story we know that the activation energy is the minimum energy needed for that reaction to take to take place so for the forward reaction the activation energy will be the difference between that peak and the energy of the reactants okay but for the reverse reaction the activation energy will be what um, is going to be all of this because remember it will start from the energy of this because remember for the reverse reaction these are the reactants and then you would need this much to get an activated complex and then when these products start forming they will release that energy to this region but you can tell that this one consumes energy so this becomes an endothermic reaction so now let's have a look so we are told here that the delta H that means the energy of the forward reaction in fact zero is not even here anymore because this is negative uh, ah, it's fine anyway when it's negative it tells us that this is lower than uh, remember delta H is the difference so it doesn't really it's, it's actually okay so let's say for example here all this tells us is that whatever value this is minus that one is minus 50 because remember when you're taking a smaller number you're subtracting a bigger number from a smaller number you get a negative value all right so that is something like that so basically all I'm, I'm getting here is that this difference between these two is going to be 50 right and then of course if you're saying this one minus that you're going to get minus 50 if you're saying that one minus this one you're getting plus 50 and as we see that this is an equilibrium situation if this forward reaction is minus 50 obviously the reverse reaction should be minus 50 because they are in balance but the activation energies are the ones that would differ all right so we know that this whole one here is 110 okay so now what is the activation energy for the forward reaction it's going to be this 110 minus this 50 right because that only leaves us the smaller portion at the top so for this portion here right we're going to have to take this hole here which they're telling us it's 110 we subtract the difference between these two because this is the difference between the two 
it's 50 but for the forward it's going to be negative for the reverse it's going to be positive we really don't care what is there it can be any value but such that the difference between them is 50 okay so we know that ah to get this activation energy for the forward reaction is going to be this whole minus this part it, it leaves us that part so 110 minus 50 is 60 so that is the best way i find makes sense because it's very difficult to guess this thing it's very difficult so that is going to be b so again you can, you can see these are not very easy questions as very simple as they look but these are sort of like higher grade type questions because they kind of require you to remember something much more detailed than what you are being provided. But some people are very quick. They can be able to make the difference in their heads. But I always feel like the graphical representation of some things helps to make sense of what you need to do. All right. So I hope, guys, that was easy. I hope it made life a bit more comfortable there. So this is one of the questions that are potentials for losing marks because they are not very commonly asked so it's easy to not really figure out what is needed okay let's continue now the next question says uh, the reaction reaches equilibrium a reaction reaches equilibrium at 25 degrees celsius uh, in a flask according to the following balanced equation okay so this is cobalt crystals because once you see cobalt or any other compound for that matter complexed with water molecule, you know those are crystals, okay? So this is cobalt crystals in solution reacting with chlorine ions. This forms a cobalt tetrachloride in solution and six molecules of water. And we are told the forward reaction is endothermic because once delta H is greater than zero, that means the energy of the products is higher than the energy of the reactants, okay? So the forward reaction is endothermic. That means for this reaction to take place, you need heat, okay? You need heat for going that way. Now let's have a look. What is the story? <clears throat> it says now, which one of the following change Okay, which one of the following will change the color of the mixture from pink to blue? That means we want something that is going to favor the forward reaction. That means we want to favor the endothermic reaction. If something has to do with temperature, adding temperature will favor the forward reaction. All right? Or adding the concentration that affects ions on this side it will have to favor the forward reaction because remember Le Chatelier's principle says if a system is in equilibrium or is in balance when a disturbance is introduced the shifting will be so as to cancel the effect of that change so whatever you increase there has to be a reaction that cancels that increase and now you observe what would be the case so this is another important thing also look at the state of these uh, reactants over here and products okay adding water well if you're adding water once you increase the water molecule here the reaction that decreases water molecules which is the reverse reaction will be favored so it will change from blue to pink but we want to move from pink to blue okay so we want to go that way, not backward. So adding water will favor the backward reaction. As Le Chatelier says, you add this, you create this one to be out of balance. So to create a balance, you have to move that way so that everything balances out again. Okay. Cooling the flask. Remember we said the forward reaction is endothermic. So we needed to add heat. Okay. But if we're cooling the flask, that means we are taking heat. So the reaction that preserves that heat, which is the reverse reaction, so it's going to move from blue to pink again. So cooling this flask doesn't help the situation. It favors the reverse reaction instead. Adding sodium hydroxide. Now let's have a look at this one, uh, in a uh, solution of this one. So sodium hydroxide in here, I don't see it doing anything, honestly speaking. I really don't but what I would say is 
it's very difficult to tell what would happen here. Because what sodium, in fact, what sodium hydroxide would do from what I can see in this situation, it will dissociate into the OH- and Na+, and the Na+, will attract the chlorine and form salt, sodium chloride. So this one will actually clean out this chloride ions. And if you clean out these ones, the reaction that favors the replacement of those chloride ions will be favored. So we're going to move in the reverse direction. So yeah, actually it would favor the reverse direction because it would try to eliminate these free ions and it would donate these OH ions, okay? So we would be moving backward, okay? Um, so we won't go forward, right? So adding ammonium chloride in solution. All right, that's cool because guess what this would do? This would dissociate into the ammonium ion, which is NH4 plus and the chloride ion. But now what will it do in this flask? It will increase the number of chloride ions that are free. Now what happens in this case? Because of the so-called common ion effect between this one and these chloride ions here then you will have an increase of the concentrations of the chloride ions. And now, according to Le Chatelier's principle, we try to move this disturbance to a situation where there's an equalization of all these ions in this equation. So we will favor the forward reaction because the forward reaction cancels the increase of the chloride ions. Therefore, we will have this changing to blue because we are favoring the forward reaction therefore the last one is the perfect answer and then of course the concept this thing introduces the so-called common ion effect okay great um let's move on next one um 1.7 says dilute nitric acid dilute so that tells you already it's in solution okay not a problem Dilute nitric acid is dissolved, I mean, is added to distilled water at 25 degrees Celsius, okay? Now, this is very key. What do we know about water at 25 degrees Celsius? It has the tendency to do what? Uh, they call it what? Auto-ionization. Water does, has that property of auto-ionization where it separates into hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions, okay? It does that at 25 degrees Celsius. Hence, we have that so-called the ionization of water constant. It happens at 25 degrees Celsius, all right? Now, it says, how will this affect the hydronium ion concentration? I like the way they put it. I like to say the oxonium ion. Ah, it's fine. Hydronium, oxonium is the same thing. It's fine. Remember, what is nitric acid? is HNO3. Okay? And it's a strong acid. Dissociates completely in water. So of the strong acids, know those three. HNO3, which is nitric acid. H2SO4, this is sulfuric acid. H3PO4, which is phosphoric acid. And HCl. Know these four because they are quite commonly used in your metric exam. These are strong acids. Is it acids or is it acids? Yeah, whatever, man. It's acids actually. <laughs> strong acids, okay? Now, we have nitric acid, so we know that it dissolves completely in water, or does it? Do we say it ionizes completely in water, okay? Great. So how will this affect the hydronium ion concentration and the ionization constant of water at 25 degrees? So we said the ionization constant of water at 25 degrees remains as uh, 1 times 10 to the minus what? Where is that for me? I forgot. Is it 24? Is it minus 24? But wait. I know that sometimes you are katala. My mind is man. Forgive me, man. I cannot remember these things very well at times. Uh, where is the ionization constant of water, man? Fast, I think. 
must be here somewhere, man. It must be here somewhere. Ah, Ayiko. I can go. I'm sure. Hi, bro. That's not cool. That is not very cool. Come on, guys. Is it 24, though? Minus 24, but I think so. Hey, 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 hey. You're going to get lazy. I'm not happy with this because all those constants, they must have. They just cannot do this. Yep, they didn't write it down. It's fine, give up it. I think in the past papers, ah, it's going to waste time to look for it. Ah, Doc, where is the other paper? Eish. Now those papers are even distant from me now. Goodness. I don't even have a textbook next to me. Ah, this is bad. This is bad. You know, it's very bad because these constants need to always be written. Come on, man. Someone will always forget tidings. I always do. I sometimes use the advantage of it. <laughs> but why do I think it used to be written? Why is it not here now? Hmm? Because the ionization constant of water is constant, man. Come on now. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, guys, in any case, you know that it is, but I forgot now that it's 10 times what? I think it's minus 24 of weight. Hey, I need you again. If you're wrong, you will check it. <laughs> you will check it. But that is, the, and it lies far to the left, in fact. It's not to the right, so it's very small. I think that's why it's minus 24, but I think it's 1 times 10 to the minus 24. But please double check it in case I'm lying. Sometimes these things are distant from my head. Anyway, so we said at 25 degrees, that is the ionization constant of what? Okay. Sometimes there are certain things to remember. If they said 298 kelvins is the same as 25 degrees Celsius. So make sure you have that one under control. So we know that this is a... Um, what is this? This is a strong acid so it will ionize completely but the ionization constant of water remember kc like i said uh, kc they write it kw is equal to so kc remember is only affected by temperature so if the temperature is the same all these other things concentration changes yes they will favor forward and reverse reactions in the same manner but eventually the constant will not be affected that's why if the temperature doesn't change, we are staying stationary. So the ionization constant of water will not be affected, but the concentration of hydronium ions will increase because this one is a strong acid. So I think here the answer says increase, yes. Increase, no. Remember, temperature is the same, so it cannot. Increase, decrease, no. Increases remains the same. I think C is my best option. Remains the same, remains the same. I wouldn't say that because I know that once you add nitric acid into water, it will ionize completely. So as much as water does what we call auto ionization as well. Now remember there will be hydroxide ions as well as hydrogen ions and you adding a nitric acid which will also add those hydrogen ions so the concentration of the oxonium ions will definitely increase although the ionization constant of water itself because of the temperature remember kc is always affected by temperature and nothing else so this thing is the same as kc but for water okay all right guys again this is not an easy question to really figure out easily but if you understand how it works, again, that means you need to know a bit more as well. Then you can be able to crack it, okay? I think I'm getting too relaxed. I wanted to do this under 30 minutes and I'm already taking beyond that time. And this is not good. Anyway, we're almost done with these MCQs. But I think I'll slot in some organic chemistry questions as well. 
Consider the ionization uh, reaction. Consider the ionization reactions one and two. So we have hydrogen pyrophosphate over there, uh, plus water, which is the liquid as a solvent. It goes into the hydronium ions in solution plus that compound X. Then two, we're taking that compound X, we're adding water, and then it releases again um, hydronium ions. So this means this is an acid. But in this case, it becomes a conjugate base of this acid here. So this compound is an ampholite. Okay. Then it gives us compound Y, which is definitely a conjugate base of what? Of that acid. Okay. Or this one. Yeah, this acid. This one is going to be the conjugate base of this acid. Yeah. All right. Let's have a look. Which one of the following combinations represents? the formulae of X and Y. Now remember if this one loses just one hydrogen because this becomes remember water itself is an ampholite so it will take this one accepts the proton from this to form hydronium ions then that one will be HPO4 but once we lose one hydrogen we're gonna get two minus so this is going to be HPO4 two minus okay so we're looking for X to be that but once that loses yet another hydrogen, it's going to be now uh, PO4 3 minus. So this one should be PO4 3 minus. Let's have a look here. HPO4 2 minus. Yeah, that looks all right. A is correct because everything else, this one is fine, but this is wrong. Okay, you can't lose all the hydrogens and then you still have them back here. Because now this is like the original, the phosphoric acid. Again, here it can't be. X cannot be because we're already starting with two and we're losing. Was water accepted to get to be H3O plus? Okay. Let's not even investigate. I think we are sorted. There's some things you can just solve at a go. Some things you just have to take a little bit of time, man. A little bit of time because you need to understand what is going on right now very nice section here an electrochemical cell so we already deal with two electrochemical cells in matrix which is the electrolytic cell and the galvanic cell difference between the two the electrolytic cell is uh, non-spontaneous it needs power and then the galvanic cell pretty much runs itself okay so it's a spontaneous exothermic remember exothermic reactions tend to be spontaneous in fact they are largely spontaneous reactions okay an electrochemical cell was set up using mercury liquid going to mercury ions in solution uh, half cell and another half cell under standard conditions so when they're telling us that this is standard conditions, it means these reactions should be spontaneous, okay? They do not need heat. We assume that under standard conditions, we have fixed concentrations, and we know we can predict what will happen. Again, don't need to complicate your life over here. Just feel what you can do. It says, now, which one of the following half cells, when compared to the mercury half cell, will result in the highest potential okay that is the key word we want the highest potential that means these cells are all possible they can do it but we want the highest potential so that means you need to know that standard electrode potential table now the greater the distance between the two half cells the greater will be the electrode potential initially until that reaction reaches equilibrium i don't know why i forget that word there's a word that they use when the reaction has stopped uh, man mm. yeah i mean there is the ionization constant of water it's actually times min 10 to the minus 14 not 24. all right so you have it i was wondering why it is not there so i just i just checked at the wrong place so it's to the minus 14 not 24. all right good 
see, I was looking for something else now, and then my eyes end up looking for something else as well. And I'm killing you guys. So table A is the best because you know that at the very top you have stronger oxidizing agents. At the very bottom you have stronger reducing agents. So this is what you'll be looking at. So let's see mercury. What is going on? The way is mercury. Hg. Where is it? Show us. Hg. There is Hg. It's over there. It's already on the oxidizing it's much more of a stronger oxidizing agent than it would be a reducing agent right because anything above this hydrogen because this is the standard that's why this is called standard electrode potential every cell potential is always compared to this one because this is zero so this is the standard electrode potential so this one is much more of a oxidizing agent than it is a reducing agent if it is functioning as a reducing agent it's a weaker one now let's see aluminium going to aluminium 3 plus let's have a look where is that where is that there's aluminium liberate, liberating three electrons and aluminium compared to mercury aluminium is a stronger uh, reducing agent so this one would function as a reducing agent meaning would undergo oxidation and this one would undergo reduction so we know that we always say the electric potential of a cell is the cathode minus the anode okay cathode is 0 0,8 0, plus 0, what ah doch 85 okay let me write it in the calculator let's see uh, 0, 0,85 plus because remember it's going to be minus the aluminium one where is aluminium it's over here Ish, my position is killing me now. so aluminium is here so uh, now this is minus uh, this is minus 1,66 so this is definitely going to be minus minus going to be plus 1,66 so I get here 2,51 so let's just see here this is going to give us an electrode potential of the cell of 2,51 okay great then let's see zinc and mercury zinc is below the hydrogen as well but much higher than the aluminium so it has a much lesser potential right so all we're going to do here is going to replace our 1,66 by that of zinc. Zinc 2 plus is going to be minus 0, 0,76. So it's going to be plus 0, 0,76, uh, which I get 1,61. Okay, so this one is going to be of 1,61 volts. Of course, these are volts, okay? And then um, cobalt. Let's see cobalt two plus. Where is you, sir? There you are. So this one is above zinc. So it's even much less potential than zinc. So it's gonna be plus zero comma two eight. So this one is one comma one three. So you see it's dropping. So the E cell here going to be 1,13 volts okay so t do you see that a is bigger ne? let's see platinum in fact this is the hydrogen one which is the standard okay so remember the hydrogen one is zero so platinum functions as a catalyst here so this one is zero so basically it's going to be just that standard electrode potential for the cell so the E cell here is just going to be the standard electrode potential of mercury which is 0, 0,85 volts so obviously A is our answer A becomes the answer so that is a nice question again easy question but it makes you work because you've got to check all of them of course if you find one that has a, an, an, an unspontaneous reaction you cancel that one out you don't even bother looking at it 
but in this case they will always fool you because the way they put them is such that you have to decide yourself how would this reaction occur spontaneously rather than non-spontaneously okay but when they write it in a particular manner then they are forcing you to reason in such a way that okay you're going to have to accept it as non-spontaneous all right good another good two marks let's do the last one and breathe for a second okay the following reaction takes place in an electrochemical cell okay again we said we have two electrochemical cells we have an electrolytic cell and a galvanic cell we know that the electrolytic cell is non-spontaneous the following reaction takes place now look at this again once you see this aq it means it's in solution and in solution you will have ions of this right so basically copper here is cu2 plus ions that you have and then chlorine here is basically cl it's two cl minus ions so basically when you introduce the electric current so this is essentially decomposition of copper chloride okay so when you once you decompose you know you're going to have to introduce an electric current to split this two into these ions in solution okay but now there are graphite electrodes that are used because graphite does not react it's accepted as inert or chemically inert so it won't get involved in this but we use it as a means to an end okay so we know that ah, we will have our electric electrolytic cell like that we have this solution here of copper chloride so this is cucl2 of course we will have this graphite um, electrodes and then these will be connected to the battery right right yeah, i'm not sure if i'm representing this correctly yeah maniac yeah maniac so yeah this one should be positive this remember the anode is positive in this case as opposed to the galvanic cell here the long one is with the positive and then this one is with the negative either way we didn't specify anything here so what will what will this battery do uh, it will cause these ones to split into their ions all right then of course this one because it's connected to the negative terminal then it, it makes this one this plate negative but remember the graphite plate this one because it's connected to the positive it becomes positive okay now positive attracts positive so chloride chloride ions will come and latch onto this one and then chlorine gas which is greenish greenish yellowish will start forming at this plate and then because this one is positive it will be attracted by the negative then you'll start to see a brownish uh, coating on those uh, electrodes forming over there so it says now which one of the following is correct so we can see that this meant came out as ions then ended up as solid which is what will happen at the anode no at the cathode which is the negative terminal in, in this case and then here we can see that chlorine gas is going to be forming and of course from the standard electrode potentials when you oxidize chloride ions okay they form chlorine gas it starts from right to left so look at this one here so you see chloride ions when they go to the left remember this is oxidation and you're going that way so it gets oxidized into chlorine gas so this one is going under is undergoing oxidation but when you're looking at copper 2 plus um it started this side and going that way because it started as ions and now it's solid so it says now which one of the following is correct for this cell it is a galvanic cell a hell no galvanic means spontaneous reactions okay so this one is non-spontaneous so it can't be power is needed definitely but let's read on the reaction is spontaneous never so this one is already out that one is out B we know okay we're looking at it but remember don't rush sometimes these questions can mess with you copper acts as an oxidizing agent remember an oxidizing agent causes the other one to be oxidized and copper here by taking electrons is copying i mean is causing chlorine ions or chloride ions to 
go and form chlorine gas okay but here's the problem copper itself is not the oxidizing agent because this is the copper but copper ions are being oxid I mean are being reduced to copper and by being reduced they but remember here it's ions not copper but it's copper ions so you need to be very careful these questions can be very tricky I mean this is one of those questions you would want to put in asterisk as well and say it's not really easy you would be fooled to believing that this is the answer because this is what seems to be happening but it's not copper copper is not the oxidizing agent but copper ions if they said ions yes so because now they didn't say copper ions they just said copper no so the answer now becomes B. This is the best answer. If there wasn't a best answer there, maybe you'd have to accept it because these are some of those answers that are vague. But but yeah, I would think B is the best because it's not copper but copper ions that act as oxidizing agent in this case. All right. That sums up the 20 marks of this question, guys. Um, I hope you have enjoyed that one. I don't know, I feel like I can pull in maybe this organic chemistry part, but this thing is long, man, and I don't want this to be very long. But yeah, let's see. Let us see what we can do. Maybe let's just pull in question two and see how far we can go. Let's just try because we can't really. I'll try just this 30 minutes and see if I cannot do better. So question two. So we're going to try and move much faster now. I think MCQs are tricky, guys. Maybe you, maybe you can see that they are not very straightforward. Very few questions are straightforward, but most are quite a night. Flippin' me. But don't use that word and say flippin'. You can't be angry, man. Why are you angry? There's no need for anger here, but excitement, definitely. Okay, it says letters A to H in the table below represent eight organic compounds. Okay, fine. A, we can see here there's a condensed structure of formula. It's one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Let's see when we start from this side chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Let's see when we don't get there, we just branch one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Yeah, but we can't really do this because it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five. So five is less than six. So we can see here technically the longest chain is six carbons, but let's just choose the straight chain as the parent chain because it doesn't matter. Even if you choose this, all of these chains, the side chains, will be at exactly the same position, so they won't change much. Okay, not a big deal. Um, so this is six carbon chains, so it's a hexane. So now you name this closest to the side chains. So you, you st uh, sorry, you number the carbons as very close to the as many side chains as possible. So here we can see we have two. So there's two of them rather than just one. So we're going to start saying this is carbon one and then that's carbon six over there. So this is the second carbon. So this is two bromo because we have to follow the alphabet. B comes before meth, which is methane. So this is two bromo, two comma three, four comma four comma five tri methyl hexane okay very nice word there all right not a problem so we said this is going to be two bromo two comma said this is two three four comma four comma five uh tri methyl hexane yo ha but you, you get the dream always get the habit of trying to name these things before you start sweating with the questions because those questions are going to make you cry as well b well there's a double bond there on the second carbons but there's four carbons in this chain one two three four so this is but or but 
put two in part two in you can just say part two in or put two in or build two in of course you're going to say build build two in because if it was here it could be build one in so those are the only two possibilities for the for the alkene group here so this is boot two in or butte two in okay no problem remove then this one is pent two in so there's five carbons here but don't bother once you have a name sometimes ugh, don't overly do these interpretations but anything that is already a structure try to name it all right, so this is pent two in fine. This is one, two, three, four. So we have a condensed structural formula. Remember, I said once you have that CHO at the end, it tells you we are dealing with aldehyde. So it's one, two, three, four. So this is butanal. Butanal. The al is for aldehyde. So there's four, one, two, three, four. And there's a CHO group, which is the carbonyl group. So this is butanal, dealing with aldehydes. Then there's butan 2 own okay? Butan 2 own But don't you see these two are sort of like related in a way? Because there's an aldehyde group, there's a carbonyl group, carbonyl group, there's four carbons, there's four carbons. So these should be functional isomers, okay? Because they belong to two functional groups, but the molecular formula would be the same. Anyway... Um, what is this one? 4,4 dimethyl pent 2 ion. So it's an alkyne. I'm sorry that you probably won't see there. So this is 2 ion. Alright, so this branding here messed up. But get a copy, you'll see that. So butane, it's an alkane. Easy. It's usually gaseous. Uh, H is what? This is COOH, so we know that this is carboxyl group, so 1, 2, 3, 4. So we have butanoic acid. Okay, great stuff. So I think we are ready to hustle some questions now here. It says now, write down the letter that represents a compound that is a ketone. What is a ketone? Butan to own. That's a ketone, so that's letter E. Okay, let's deal with this, guys. Let's deal with this, guys, now. Push again, man. Let's see how push about fit. Okay, so do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. 2.1. Um, let's do it. So, 2.1. Let's do it. So, the letter that is a ketone, we said is going to be E. They said a letter. So, we know that once you say own, talking about ketones that hone one one ian ian way okay here's the general formula of cn h2n minus two what is that so this is the formula or the homologous series of alkynes alkynes all right so this is definitely letter F. So two comma one comma two. So this is now F because that's the only alkyne that we have. Let's just check and be sure. Sometimes it's easy to not be sure. Let's just take the simplest alkyne, which is ethyne. All right, ethyne. So we know that it's four carbons. So once you already have three, you have these ones. Ethyne. Now let's see if we're writing this formula, it's going to be C2 H2. So let's see, does it fit into this general formula? So you put a two there, it's gonna be C2. You put a two there, it's four. Four minus two is two. So yes, it does fit. Okay, sometimes you just have to check and be sure. It's easy to make mistakes. So we know that we are done. We got that one mark. We're not playing here. We are not playing at all. Hariba Bali. Aye. As tang, as tang, as tang, and eh. As tang, as tang. Lava tang, I win. In Kariagu? Show my swiss. All right. Um, 
Okay, 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 okay. Let's do this one right. I'm talking nonsense again as always. Ugh, but, but I'm trying to gather my thoughts, you know. Cannot cry. Please. I hope I'm not making you angry by doing that. Uh, it's just in my nature, you know. To try and cool off a little bit. Okay, 2.1.3 says, Is an isomer of 2-methyl put to in? 2-methyl but to in. Okay. Is an isomer of 2-methyl but to in. So let's think about it. Methyl group has a CH group, but it's on the second carbon because they are saying 2-methyl. So meaning it's on the second carbon, but we don't care. The parent chain here is 4 carbons plus 1 of the methyl group. It makes us 5 carbons. And it's an alkene. Of course, this is in the second carbon. So what does it tell us? Pent, pent 2 in has 5 carbons. So again, it's an alkene. So definitely this one is this one. So it's compound C. So 2.1.3 is C. Okay. So 5 carbons. There's 5 carbons. It's an alkene. It's an alkene. So definitely it's A. Chain isomer, yeah, something like that. Has the same molecular formula as ethyl ethanoate. Ethyl ethanoate is definitely, remember these ones are esters. Esters are always isomers, functional isomers of uh, carboxylic acids. So this one is definitely that one. Remember, if we were to think of it as ethyl ethanoate, ethyl has what? two carbons on the side, the ethyl group. Ethanoate has two carbons as well. Think about it here. There's one, two, three, four. And then there would be that double O situation. So that is the one. So it's compound H here. 2.1.4 is going to be H. H, 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 H. Not H. Mona Zots. Arriba Naba Zots. Artamik Mona. Ria Verega. Wabon. Wow on Harbana Rebahala Totsedikudukud. Uh let's let's push guys. I'm being silly. I'm sorry for that again. Uh, write down the IUPAC name of compound A. Yes, you see we already did the job. Now we're just going to transcribe. So two point two goes into two point two point one. I did not even mark myself, but it's just single marksman. Why? All right, so compound, uh, sorry, the IUPAC name. Remember what does IUPAC stand for? International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Okay, always remember that. You can be asked sometimes, what does IUPAC stand for? You don't want to be chowed by simple things like that. Inter International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Okay, name of compound A. So we said it's going to be... We're starting with this. We said that we established the six carbons in the longest chain. I mean, even if you try to use this as the longest chain, you will see that these functional groups, the methyl group and the bromide group, they are right on the second carbon. It doesn't change anything. Okay? Even if you try to do this, you snake it around or you do it like that, or you, you will just be in the same position. So nothing changes. So we said this is going to be two bromo. Two uh, bromo uh, two comma four comma five right uh, try methyl hexane. Very long name, huh? Two bromo two comma four comma five trimethyl uh, hexane. Okay, that's the name. So here you're getting three marks for naming this side don't don'ts and the parent chain. Okay, so that is what you get. You know, stuff like that. Stuff like that. Fun stuff indeed. Two point two point two. Uh, let's move on. The structural formula of compound F. 
Well, we know that the parent chain is pent, so there's five situations there, there's five carbons, so we're going to have one, two, three, four, five. I'm just going to keep it long like this and not make it, you know, move around a little bit. So the simplest is you can do is just a straight chain. Now, on carbon four, we have methyl groups, so we have to decide. Now, when do we decide? We first have to find the functional group is two iron. So second carbon has the triple bond. So let's say second carbon. Remember this is first carbon. Second carbon is here. It's one, two, three. All right? All right. So the carbon can only have four bonds. So now this bond is like this and that bond is like this. There can't be hydrogens there because only four bonds are allowed. Okay? Now we have four comma four. So this is two, three. Now on this fourth carbon, we're going to have methyl groups because they said is di, oh my goodness, yeah, dimethyl, dimethyl. Don't dimethyl, but it's like two methyls, <laughs> four comma four. Okay, yeah, pent two ion. So we are sorted right here. So we are sorted. So we're going to have our hydrogens over there. Then we have our hydrogens over there. And there. And there. And there. So a very nice structure here. Branched stuff, you know. Uh, I hope it's right. One, two, three, four, five. On second carbon we have the functional group. Two ion. And we have fourth carbon. So now this one takes precedence over side chains. Okay, functional group takes precedence over what side chains. So you can't say ah uh ah, -uh, but this one is the closest. But think of the functional group. So I think we got it. I think we got it. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So again, you're getting three marks here. Yes. So I think for showing the position of the functional group and then the positions of the side chains on the fourth carbon and the parent chain itself as a whole meaning the naming of those carbons is proper so we get our three marks and we say thank you very much so I hope that one was easier so 2.3 fat as the story about 2.3 is so man. I wish I knew how to speak like this Africans very well. I would be a silly guy. So now, you know, I thought is they speak so well of that language. I want to speak Africans. Can you teach me the. For compound D, write down the homologous series to which it belongs. You know what we're saying about homologous? Homologous series to which it belongs. What is that? Compound D is pent to in. It belongs to alkenes. What? No, man. What are you talking about now? This is compound D, man. It's an aldehyde. Aldehyde. Homologous series is aldehydes. So this is 2.3.1. So we're going to say aldehyde. Not hiding, but aldehyde. Yeah. That is the story. Compound D is an aldehyde. We said it's what is butanal. Butanal. Name of its functional group. Oh my lord. You see, I like these things. When you review these things properly, you see now they're not saying, they're saying the name of the functional group. What is the name of the functional group of aldehydes and ketones? Yes, you said it right. It is carbonyl carbonyl group carbonyl group okay great great so it's carbonyl carbonyl whatever you want to say there is actually no master of pronunciation but I would like to believe there is one and guess who that person is you you don't want to know and I'm not telling 
All right. Um, this one says um, the structure or formula of its functional isomer. Remember now, when you say functional isomer, that means something next door, isn't it? So we said isomers, functional isomers to aldehydes is ketones. Okay. So we said that is butanal. Butanal. So, but because in ketones, if you have the same number of carbons, remember we're going to have to have the same number of carbons and that single carbonyl group. So, compound E is butane to own. So, it's going to be exactly the functional isomer. So, they said what? Uh, let's just see what is the story here. The structural formula of its functional isomer. So, this guy is the one. So, we just need to do compound E basically. They are asking us to do compound E indirectly because this one is going to have the same situation. Let's see. Um, uh, so one, two, three, four. Now on the second carbon you can choose which one you like. So I like this one sometimes. It's double bond oxygen. That is the carbonyl group. And then it's bonded to the carbon over there. Remember four uh, bonds there. So hydrogens because they wanted the structural formula. So we've got to give it to them. Brass. So let's see how many hydrogens here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, eight hydrogens, one oxygen, four carbons. Let's see here how many hydrogens there are. Three. Five, seven, plus that one, eight. Carbons, one, two, three, four. So there's four carbons like we have here. One oxygen, there's one oxygen. So we got it. It's the one. But they just wanted to give us trouble. But you can take this one and put it here. You can even make it face down. It's still all right. Okay. I think that's the one. So how many marks are we getting here? Two marks. I think the main thing is getting that uh, carbonyl group there. And then for the rest of the chain, two marks. We are happy. We are very happy. So 2.4. Now it says, um, for compound G, write down. Now we're talking about butane here. So now we are in this station. That is our stop right there. It says now, um, write down. The IUPAC name of a chain isomer. Chain isomer. Remember, there's just one chain isomer for butane, is methyl propane, because it has four carbons. So it's methyl propane. You can say two methyl propane, but for it to be a methyl group, it's always going to be on that second carbon. So we just say methyl propane. So they said IUPAC name. So you just write methyl, whoa, don't rush my way to 4.1 day. So we say it's methyl propane. That's the chain isomer, okay? Great. It will have four carbons. Some people like to write two methyl propane. I mean, it's still allowed, but Technically, there's nowhere else you can put that methyl group for it to be methyl group. If you put it on the first carbon, you no longer have uh, propane. You'll just have butane, okay? But an angulated structure rather than straight. So, methyl propane is enough. Two marks for the two names, methyl and propane. No problems. 2.4.2. It says, write a balanced... Oh, this one was famous question during our time. Write a balanced equation using molecular formulae for its complete combustion. So butane. Yertok. That one is silly. You wanna cry here. So butane is what? Uh, is C4H10, I think. One, two, three, four. Then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. If you're just going to consider there's gonna be hydrogens there. So it's C4H10. So we're burning it in oxygen or in air. 
So oxygen is a diatomic gas. So what happens when you burn hydrocarbons in air? You get carbon dioxide, CO2, plus water. All right. Now, this is where life becomes a bit difficult now. Now, first you balance the carbons, right? Right. So when we balance the carbon, so you don't want to write anything down. It's, it's problematic, I promise you. But let's just work on this one for a second. Um, so we're going to say, okay, there's four carbons. Let's put four here. There's how many hydrogens? There's 10. Let's put five here because five times two is 10. Four times four is four, right? Then now we calculate the oxygen. So the first thing, always balance the carbons first. Secondly, do the hydrogens and then the, the oxygens. Now, let's see. Here we have five oxygens. These ones are, f are two. Two times four is eight. So eight plus five, we have 13. But this one, we can't really get 13 now here. It's problematic. What is 13 by two? Let's see. Ah, this is horrible. It's 6,5, but you don't want commas. Remember, it's not allowed to put commas. Can't do it. You can't do that. So if it gets a comma, comma 5, remember that's divided by 2. So we just want to multiply by 2 throughout, isn't it? Mm. So we just multiply by 2 throughout. When we multiply by 2 throughout, here we're going to get, therefore we're going to have here, this one uh, is going to be what? What, what, what? What is it going to be now? Ah, uh, is it going to be anything? Yeah, we're going to multiply this by 2 and say C4, 2C4, H10, okay? But now we have 8 carbons here. Plus, um, then we multiply by 2 everything, and remember that was uh, 6 over 2, sorry, 6,5. That's like uh, 13 divided by 2. So when you multiply by 2, you remain with 13. So it's going to be 13, 0, 2. Uh, going into, we multiply by 2, here we get 8 CO2 molecules plus... Multiply by 2, there we get 10 H2O. Now let's see if everything is balanced so that it's nicer. You don't want commas, ne? Always eliminate them. So what do we get? Yeah, um, we get uh, 8, 8 carbons, 20 hydrogens, 2 times 10 is 20, oxygens are 26. Now, 8 by 2 is 16, plus 10, that's 26, so it's balanced. So this is your best. Always use the lowest number of multiples there to get it right. So it can be a bit tricky, but what is nice here is that you had 13 over 2 here to get it balanced already. But you don't want this on the denominator. That's why we then multiplied by that 2 throughout to eliminate it. So you know that if you had 13 over 2 here, then it means you have to multiply by 2 throughout, at least to get it off the denominator. Then this number doubles to 8, that number doubles to 10, that one goes to 2. So I hope you like this one. So how many marks are they giving here? 3 marks. Yeah, I don't know how these 3 marks come about. It's a bit crazy, I promise you. It's a bit crazy. So let's not even try to do it. So that sums up the 19 marks of this question. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, maybe we can pull in yet another question. Why not? Let's try, maybe. If we can just do these first four questions, I'd be happy. Then we can finish off the last five. A little bit later. So let's look at question three. All right, so question three says, um, let us investigate factors that influence, factors that influence the boiling points. Keywords, Buffett, look, in science, English is not just English here. 
It has a meaning. So please, I don't know how much. I don't know how much I can do. I don't know how much I can do. I don't know how much I can do. Yang pak yang cari lagi pak, eh hore, kesinya nak aku ibi. Okay, I don't want to waste time, guys. Don't want. I'm going to try. I prepare, man. Salvage this time. Okay, factors that influence the boiling points of organic compounds. Now, what are the factors that influence boiling points? Yeah, is it long chain? Is it short chain? Is it branched chain? Is it not branched chain linear? Um, the type of bonds that are in there, uh, the functional groups that are in there. So there's a lot of things to imagine, or not to imagine, but to put into consideration when you're talking boiling points, melting points, uh, even the phases in room temperature. Is it going to be gas or liquid or solid? So stuff like that, okay? Now, now I want to think about those factors, okay? It says now the boiling points of some organic compounds obtained are shown below, right? No problem. Propane, three carbon compound. Its molecular mass is 44. You can see significant. What is the boiling point is minus 42. So it's already less than zero. So that means propane at room temperature, which is 21 degrees Celsius or roughly 25. But 21 to 25 is what you would get in room temperature, right? Right. So it's already a gas because it's, it's beyond its boiling point. So its vapor pressure is very high. When we say vapor pressure is high, we mean this thing is mostly gaseous. It's already a gas at the time. So mind you, when you say vapor pressure is high, that means most of it is already in gaseous phase. But a low one, it means it's more of liquid than it would be a gas or solid than it would be a gas, okay? So think about those things, guys. A higher boiling point, so a very low boiling point means a high vapor pressure, you know, and vice versa. Butane, it has more carbons than that one. So you can see that the larger number of carbons, the bigger the molecular mass. And what happens to the boiling point? It increases, okay? That means this one has a much lower vapor pressure than propane. Pentane, again, five. You can see as we increase um, the number of carbons, we actually do what? We, let's just say from here, from here, because these are just straight chains. Now you can see the greater the number of carbons in the chain, the higher the molecular mass and the higher the boiling point and of course the lower is the vapor pressure there but now you can see that between these two they are of the same number of carbons but this one methyl butane is branched but look the molecular mass is the same because it's what the same number of carbon atoms in the in hydrogen atoms but look at this, boiling point for that straight chain is higher than the boiling point of this branched chain. So what does this mean? We know that the longer chains, they have a larger surface area for the intermolecular forces to act. So once they start to have a larger surface area, they tend to be much stronger than when it's branched. Because when it's branched, it assumes a spherical shape. So it's much easier to separate spherical objects than long lengthy objects isn't it you know that even in real life so that is the idea so again here they're telling you that if it is branched then it will have a lower molecular i mean a lower boiling point for the same molecular mass all right ethanol and ethanol we know here there are some polarities to this these are sort of like partially polar uh, um, compounds now ethanol it's like two carbons, molecular mass is 46, and the boiling point is 78. Ethanol, which is again two carbons, and then one oxygen as well as that one. These are isomers, by the way. Are they isomers? Oh my God, let me not say things that I'm going to regret. <laughs> yeah, ethanol. Remember this one? Look at this one. It's 44. It's much lower, and its boiling point is 20. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, what is the difference here? We know that ethanols, alcohols, and carboxylic acids, they have strong intermolecular forces called hydrogen bonding. And now the stronger those intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point, okay? The lower the vapor pressure. But these ones have what we call dipole-dipole molecules because these molecules are partially polar and partially nonpolar. So they form dipole-dipole uh, forces, which are much stronger than the London forces, but they are themselves the so-called van der Waals forces. So they're much weaker, so that tells you why that uh, boiling point is lower. Okay, now that we explored our table a bit, I think we are ready to answer these questions. So what is the first question? It says, define the temp boiling point. So again, we say it is a temperature at which, don't write at which like that, write at properly, I'm being silly, at which the vapor pressure of a substance you don't have to specify which one a substance you need to speak in general uh, it, it is a temperature at which a vapor pressure of a substance is equal to the atmospheric pressure great no problem there's many ways of saying this but look once you get the temperature number one two vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure or you can say the atmospheric pressure is balanced or is in balance with I mean, you can use some scientific language if you want you can say they're at equilibrium like fancy words but what is the point this thing it says they're just equal so it's fine we walk away without two marks now the boiling points of compounds a b and c you see we already did the comparison now um, how do okay what is the story here the boiling points of uh, compounds a b and c are compared okay fine it says how do the boiling points vary from compound a to compound c choose increases decreases uh, remains the same we know that it increases right then it says explain your answer so three marks already we said that the explanation here uh, uh, what can you say uh, explain your answer so you can just say here yeah, there longer the carbon chain there higher is the boiling points due to increasing strength of the intermolecular forces again I food buffet don't try to read this thing you're not gonna understand it but just hear what I'm saying sometimes I'm lazy to write down it takes me a little bit longer so what I'm saying is the carbon okay the longer the carbon chain the higher is the boiling point due to the stronger weight due to increasing strength of intermolecular forces first of all the longer the carbon chain um, the higher the boiling point those are the first two marks due to increasing strength of intermolecular forces due to the increased surface area over which they will play okay so that is how you get your three marks okay if you don't mention intermolecular force strength the long chain and the higher boiling points then i don't think you're gonna get all those three marks so i think that is where the explanation should play around so it says now the boiling points of compounds um, b c and d are compared b c and d okay now do you see what is going on here uh, Pentane and methyl butane have five carbons. This one is four carbons. Now, let's see here. It says uh, the boiling points are being compared. Is It says, is it a fair comparison? 
My answer is, hell yeah, it's fair. Give a reason for your answer. Come on, man. Come on, brah. These ones belong to the same homologous series, okay? Uh, I can say, first, they belong in the same homologous series, okay? Uh, two, uh, they are of increasing uh, number of carbons in the chain. Or should we speak about the structure? Uh, we can just say a uh, different, I don't know, different chains of the same number of carbon atoms in the chain. I don't know, man. I, sometimes some explanations can be cumbersome. Like, you know, yeah. So the boiling points, uh, I'd say they belong in the same homologous series, which is alkanes. All right, two, they are just different arrangements of the same molecular mass. I mean, methyl butane is not that far off from pentane, okay? It, it is far off, but not too far off, okay? So uh, I think it's a fair one. I mean, you can have plenty of things to say here. I mean, there's no standard particular answer that you can say, as long as it makes sense and it captures some of the important facts. You don't try to reproduce the book here, but try to capture as much of what the book would narrate anyway. Um, let's go on. It says the boiling points of compounds E and F are compared, okay? It's just not complicate our lives. So E and F, yeah. Um, now, the boiling points of compounds E and F are compared. It says state the independent variable for this comparison. Okay? So, what is the independent variable? Obviously, boiling points here is the dependent variable, right? Because the boiling point will depend on something in this molecules. What is that something that it depends on? It is the strength of the intermolecular forces. So I would choose that one and say here the strength of intermolecular forces in these compounds because that is independent. It is just innate to the structure. But as a result of that, then the, the, the boiling points will rely on those strengths. As we said, this dipole dipole are weaker than the hydrogen bonds in ethanol. So I would say the independent would be the strength of the intermolecular forces in these compounds. Okay, Write down the name of the strongest van der Waals. Van der Waals, they stated, force. Okay present in compound F. Compound F is ethanol. So ethanols and uh, what is this? Ketones, they have dipole-dipole forces as well as uh, hydrohalogens or something like that. So this is dipole dipole forces. So these are the stronger van der Waals forces to the London forces but they belong under the same category of van der Waals forces. Which compound D or E has a higher vapor pressure? Now, which compound what? D or E? D is methylbutane, E is ethanol. Now, question is, which one has a higher vapor pressure? Give a reason for your answers. We said the higher the boiling point, the lower the vapor pressure, okay? Great. So which one has a higher boiling point between the two? E has a higher boiling point than D. Therefore, D has a higher vapor pressure than E. So the question says, which compound D or E has a higher vapor pressure? It is D. The reason is it has a lower boiling point okay 
Don't even try to complicate your life. But you know what it means. Lower boiling point means weaker intermolecular forces. Okay? So it takes less energy to break them than the other one. Lower boiling point, maybe you can even say due to lower intermolecular forces. Due to lower strength of intermolecular forces than E. Great. Not a problem. So you're just being comprehensive. But if you said it has a lower boiling point, you even are. Okay, so for choosing D is fine. So there's your two marks. All right, guys, that takes us into our nice 12 marks. So I hope you enjoyed that one. I tried to write on the paper eh, to try and salvage time. Sometimes it kills me when I have to write everything out. Extra. Let's just finish this organic chemistry, okay? Let's just chow it so that we can now focus on some serious chemistry, okay? This one is serious too, but I feel it's weak compared to what you would do, like stoichiometry. I feel like those calculations are cooler. Now it says, study the following incomplete equations for organic reactions one and two. Mm. Here, we have the structure here. How many carbons? Always establish how many carbons. One, if you're starting on the side chain, two, three, four. Of course, you can't go this way because it's three. So this one has four. Or one, two, three, four. So I always feel like it's easier to take the, the straight chain. Because the side chain can confuse you. But even if you take the side chain, this methyl group is going to be on the second carbon anyway. It doesn't change its position. Now we're using sodium hydroxide, but remember, keyword is concentrated. Once you use concentrated, you're going to eliminate something here. Okay? You're going to eliminate something here. And we can see here we have a major product. We have sodium bromide and T, which we don't know what it is. So we don't know this. We don't know that. That's reaction one. Okay, not a problem. So once we use concentration, now we're dehydrating or we are eliminating something. So obviously this is going to be an alkene. Definitely it's going to be an alkene of some kind. Then of course, once we have this one, probably water is going to be this one. Because once this one leaves the OH group alone and starts picking up the bromine, this one will attract the hydrogen and form water molecules. So T should be water. Major product is part of this structure over here. All right, <clears throat> no problem, let's just leave that for now. Then we have here ethanoic acid or acetic acid. Two carbons, COOH at the end, tells you that this is a carboxylic acid, ethanoic acid or acetic acid. Compound Q, it forms butyl ethanoate. Now this is an ester and water, and we know that this happens when we use sulfuric acid as a catalyst to dehydrate this thing to form what we call a condensation reaction, which is nothing but an elimination reaction of some sort. Anyway, let's not say too much. We're going to die. So if we're doing esters, this must be an alcohol. Okay? But of course, this part the butyl tells us that we have butanoic acid and usually we use primary alcohols for this job. We don't use secondaries and tertiary alcohols. This one usually uses primary alcohol. So I can simply say this must be butanoic acid because we have a butyl group. All right, let's see now. For reaction one, write down the uh, re type of reaction that takes place. Again, pay attention, they don't say name of the reaction, but the type of the reaction that takes place. Okay. Um, let's see. Question four. I'm going to try and write this time. Don't want to be too comfortable. 4.1, 4.1.1. So what is the type of reaction that takes place in reaction one? 
remember we said it's an elimination reaction because we're eliminating things here so this is an elimination this is elimination <laughs> reaction okay that's much better 4.1.2 you see my position is killing me I'm already writing bad naturally so you can say elimination reaction done uh, because they said type they didn't say the name so you don't want to say but if you are to say the name of this elimination reaction you see you're removing the bromine and hydrogen so what is that called um, the name if they said what is the name the name is what we call dehydrohalogenation so we're removing a hydrogen and halide or a halogen so it's called dehydrohalogenation but you can write that word it's fine but the type there's four types we have addition elimination substitution and what yeah that's not too big but it doesn't just confuse enough <clears throat> i don't want to confuse myself and also to confuse you guys so let's just move it's too late now um now, IUPAC name for compound P. <coughs> so now this one is a very high order question. Uh, you're not gonna just walk through this one. So you did. You need to do some work here. First of all, we're not losing carbons. Okay, we're just going to lose the side group. So let's just do this structure first of all. One, two, three, four, and then that side chain. Let's just have a look at it before we can decide what we're going to say. One two three four okay of course these are hydrogens over there this is the methyl groups okay let's not be lazy let's just work guys we are practicing right we're not really in a hurry for answers are we no we should not um let's see here we have a hydrogen we have a bromine we have another hydrogen over there. Okay, great. So this is the structure that we have. Okay, so we're saying we're going to eliminate this guy and some hydrogen. But now the question is, where is this hydrogen going to come out from? Remember, if we're removing this hydrogen here, we cannot remove that one at the same time. Okay. Because remember, um, primary alcohol, okay, primary carbon chains don't really live, they don't lose easily, as well as secondary carbons. Primary carbons, remember this one is a secondary carbon because this carbon is bonded to two other carbons. That's a secondary carbon. A primary carbon is this one, which is just bonded to one other carbon. But tertiary carbons like this one, they tend to lose easily because they... You know, branched stuff as well tends to react much more easily than the straight chains. I don't know why. Yeah, so basically you can't lose two in one like that. If you already lost here, you're not going to lose here again. So where will this hydrogen come from? The rule says the hydrogen will be lost from the carbon that has the less hydrogens. But of course, even though this one has less hydrogens, but... Remember, this one already has lost the bromine group. So the one that is the next one with the less hydrogens bonded to it is this carbon because it's just one hydrogen. So this hydrogen will also be lost. Okay. So now what do we end up with? We're going to end up with this situation right here. All right. Um, this one is not going to lose because we said the primary uh, hydrogens don't tend to you know mess with each other as well so we're going to have these carbons here like that but once we lose these two guys a double bond will form here and then another carbon over there and then another carbon so that's what we're going to have so one two three so we're going to have 
that methyl group over there then all the bonds are there and then here we're going to have one other hydrogen maybe this one you can put it here if you want there's what we call cis trans sort of things around the bonds not gonna go into that geometry it's a bit hectic but it's nice we're talking about chirality and a chirality hey yeah we said chiral and a chiral i loved chemistry though now this is what we need to name so where is the functional group here? Because that's the first thing you want to think about. If you're coming from this side, it's on the second carbon. You're coming from this side, it's on the second carbon. So the double bond is on the second carbon. Okay. So where is this methyl group? is also on the second carbon. You cannot come here and say this is one, two. And then you're going to say um, that methyl group must be on the third carbon. You always want the closest to the side chain as well. The functional group so this is going to be two methyl what one two three four put two in because it's on the second carbon okay so that is what we have here we have two methyl put two in this is two so that is the name we are supposed to write Okay, let's write it nicely here. So we have two methyl but two in. That's it. That's it. So I hope you guys loved that one. So again, naming those two things, you get your two marks. But do you see what you needed to do? To really get to that answer nicely so you get you, you had to do a bit more work so 4.1.3 not 2 again for 3 so uh, guys let's quickly finish this thing it's starting to take a toll on me now that is the IUPAC name of compound P name or formula of compound T so I said it's going to be water so or you can write H2O. So they said name or formula, either one of the two, get your mark. And they're already giving you a clue that, uh, okay, let's not even say anything. Oh, they gave us a clue that tea is an inorganic compound. So water is inorganic. So it's the commonest inorganic thing you would find as part of the elimination processes here. All right, so 4.1.4, it says, uh, for reaction two, two reaction conditions needed. So what is happening here? Um, well, we knew that we're going to need a catalyst because they didn't state it. We need a catalyst, which is um, sulfuric acid. So the two conditions that we need here uh, we can say one, we need a catalyst, which is what? H2SO4. But of course, you can write sulfuric acid. Okay. Two, for this thing to happen, we'll need a bit of heat as well, right? Yeah. If we don't heat, this thing is very stubborn. Remember, there's hydrogen bondings with the alcohol. Remember, alcohol is not just a single molecule here. There's multiple molecules of this compound. So to break them so that we can have this, we need heat. Because those are hydrogen bonds. They are strong. So you can't just expect them not to give up their thing. And remember, we said this is going to be a primary alcohol. It's even more stubborn than a tertiary alcohol. Okay, so those are the two conditions that we're going to need for this one. Um, walk away with our two marks there. So 4,1,5. It says the structural formula of compound Q is stuff. So we, we said that this is but butanoic. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4. And then this one. Uh, what am I doing? 
we, we said what this is going to be butanol butanol so this must be the hydrogen hydrogen this is going to be the OH so hydrogens hydrogens okay great so that is a mistake there it's a hydrogen carries the OH group so that's the one so you get functional dot doni and then the parent chain so two marks stay easy so that is cool guys i hope you can follow nicely yo this thing is long man it's long 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 riding it's trying to kill me man it's trying to kill me but i will never die i'm the di i'm not the dying type <laughs> i'm not scared of cabbage tree you know it won't kill me at all so it should not kill you as well now the cracking of long chain hydrocarbons so the cracking now we have a decane over there it takes place in a test tube A okay this is cotton soaked in decane then we're using aluminium trioxide obviously you know cracking uses high temperatures so this is very high pressures and temperatures temperatures so if we're going to use this guy we're going to lower the requirement so we're going to lower these we're going to have reasonable temperatures because this one becomes a catalyst okay great stuff so it tells you that you can do it in the lab now than to do it in the industry you see you see some things simplify your life a little bit because you would need to do this in some sort of silly chemical plant in some industry but now this can allow you to actually try this out in the lab as you can see this is a lab thing now okay takes place in a test tube a as shown below so cotton wool there dipped into this one and then we're burning this thing but reasonably lower than we would need to do it under normal circumstances and then we're bubbling this through to the bromine solution and there's a stop there Okay, let's see two straight chain organic compounds two straight chain organic compounds X and Z are produced in a test tube a following uh, balance to the following balanced equation so we have two molecules of, uh, of compound X but watch this in what form it's gaseous and Z just one molecule of it and what is it like it is a gas so once these are gases it means the carbon chains of these two compounds are not greater than four they cannot be greater than four but they have to add up to ten carbons of the parent so there's a few possibilities of course but whatever these possibilities are we cannot have a carbon chain for either one of these two that is greater than four because we know that up to four they are gases at room temperature right now let's see what is the story over here it says now state the function of aluminium trioxide great catalyst what do we know about a catalyst it lowers the activation energy needed for the reaction to take place so it means you need less heat than you would normally give for that reaction to take place okay now that's one mark done the organic compounds X and Z are now passed through bromine water listen to that water not bromine some sort of organic compound as well as a solvent but water so what is the color of bromine in water it is yellow brown so it's this brownish color it's not exactly yellow but it's sort of brownish but if you look it up like with that uh, x-ray type vision sort of you would see some yellowish tinge turning leaning more towards brown so you can say brown yellow brown so bromine water is yellow brown but in some organic solvents it's actually yellow okay all right um let's see bromine which is 
diatomic gas aqueous solution at room temperature so this is happening at room temperature again that's another keyword of what is expected to be happening there this thing is happening at what a room temperature okay uh, only compound x reacts with bromine water now here's the key at room temperature we know that these alkanes alkanes are essentially not very reactive you would need to hit them to destabilize those intermolecular forces so that they can start to become reactive so now that means you need something that is going to react pretty much spontaneously just light you know the room light not necessarily needing you know the heat per se so that means you need something like a, an unsaturated hydrocarbon so it says now um, at room temperature okay only compound x reacts with bromine water okay now what does it tell us compound x must be an alkene okay great whatever alkene but it must be an alkene because it will happen at room temperature okay um, and then it says uh, okay fine now it says apart uh, from gas bubbles being formed state another observable change we said this thing is what is yellow brown so what will it form now it's going to form a hollow alkane because this bromine is going to add to this alkene and form what we call a hollow alkane and we know that hollow alkanes are effectively orderless and colorless okay this thing has a specific order but once you bubble this through that order will disappear and also the color will disappear okay so there's two things that can happen here uh, i don't know what is the order of bromine but it smells something it, it has a smell of its own so apart from gas bubble state another observable change we can say that the yellow brown color of bromine water turns colorless and orderless okay so you can either use order or color but i think color is much more observable than order sometimes you would not want to smell these things because you might just be causing yourself problems they're not really safe so you want to look from a distance you'll see that ah, it turns a bit odd i mean colorless from that yellow brown color so that's your mark there write down the type of reaction that takes place in test tube b so what are we doing there we are adding said type not the name so the type is addition reaction which by its name is called halogenation halogenation was just adding a halogen halogen is this diatomic form of elements of group seven but when you say halide it's actually the ionic forms okay okay write down the molecular formula of compound z but remember for them to act you have to convert them into halide form <laughs> it's very funny in um, sense is cool uh, that's why we call them halogens and halides because for them to react you have to convert a halogen into a halide because when it's like this it's non-reactive it's it's ground state it's not excited so you have to first form what we call a free radical which is the ionic form which is the halide all right hmm. that's not complicated um it says um write down the molecular formula of compound z molecular formula of compound z now we have a bit of a problem here i promise you now this is where you want to cry ah man now let's have a look at this one so 4.2 so we're going to have 4.2.5 so this last question is going to hurt these last two are going to hurt greatly now remember we have first C10 uh, C10H22 so this is decane 
we're going to split into two molecules of this gas here and this gas is what reacts of course there's two possibilities here you can say here what you can form let's say you're going to form ethene okay let's say you're forming ethene what are you going to have as the other one it must be an octane but octane is liquid at room temperature so this possibility slashed you can't have that so it can't be ethene because then it would force you to have octane and octane is liquid but they already told us that this is in gaseous form so it must be a smaller compound so now there's two possibilities here it's either we're going to form here uh, say uh, whew, what must this one be let's say one two three four what we can have here let's say put one in for example uh, uh, you know let's say we have put one in here but put one in we multiply by two right there's going to be eight uh, okay I don't know why I'm making this too small so if you multiply this by two you're going to have eight right one two three four so there's going to be eight carbons here you can have now here ethane okay we can have ethane here so this would make sense because you would have an alkene two molecules of but but one in can give us um, um, what what um, it can give us uh, hmm. yeah one two three four times two eight plus two ten so we're going to get ten let's see this hydrogens one two three four five six seven eight times two that's sixteen one two three four five six sixteen plus four it's twenty two right yes i mean plus six sorry that's twenty two which gives us that decade so we have this possibility right here okay this is one possibility or what we can have across the bridge we can have prop one two three so propene can be like that it can be like that it's always prop one in okay okay so we know we can multiply this by two it gives us six okay plus now we need a butane so we can have one two three four okay so we know that one two three four plus six will give us ten all right so these are the two possibilities i don't know which route you guys want to choose because we know butane is a gas at room temperature this would be a guess so you have these two possibilities I'm really unable to decide because I don't have many clues as to what this could be so whichever route you choose of these two would be allowed okay anyway so let's have a look now it says write down this molecular formula of compound Z compound Z is going to be the alkane so um, they want the molecular formula so now you have two possibilities I'll just say a you can use this one it says molecular formula so it's C2 H6 okay C2 H6 or B it can be C4 H10 so any one of these two I think should be fine because I mean when you're cracking this longer chain uh, uh, what hydrocarbons you have a lot of possibilities 
especially of the smaller chains than the bigger ones so so any one of these two so 4.2.5 um, it says the structural formula of compound X so like I said you would have something like that you also have two possibilities here you can have C H3 F C H2 can have C H double bond C H2 okay so this could be uh, but two in sorry but one in or B which this can be just propene but of course you know these molecules are doubled but again the structure doesn't really have to capture the number of molecules but we just want the you know the monomer the monomeric structure okay so again here I feel like any one of these two will do the trick so for me um, I would take these ones and run with them so I hope I'm not wrong you guys all right um, so um, Yes, I think we are done here. We are done. Uh, that's it. Okay, guys. So whichever you choose, you get three marks because it's a bit of a heavy duty to find the this thing, the parent chain, and then of course, yeah, I don't know what else. Because for me, it would be just two marks, but yeah, you know how these guys are. Sometimes they will say for the extra work, so. I think any one of these would give you the marks, so we walk away with our 17 marks. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I, I, I didn't mean to take forever like I did, but yeah, it happened. So I'm a bit on the fence myself on these two, so I would say to you guys, please double check these ones once the memorandums come out, or double check with your peers who may be smarter, and you are also smarter by the way doesn't mean that when you didn't sit now you are not smart but it just means you know some things need a bit of time for you to be able to be in tune with them so and you may find that actually much smarter than you think so you are very smart guys don't even look down on yourselves on this one uh yeah these two i'm a bit on the fence but i am quite convinced though looking at what my formula says these two possibilities are there and of course there are multiple possibilities in reality so you would not be put to any disadvantage but you need to make sure that whatever you do balances out okay all right guys uh, i hope you enjoyed the video and i'm going to continue doing the last uh, five questions i hope it won't be too long uh, i hope i'm not gonna be tiring so let's just hope they are not too long um, so that we can just sail through them so but usually some questions are not that demanding so we can be able to finish this at a go without really needing a third video so hope you enjoyed it guys and thank you again for your patience of watching these videos and sharing them and giving those thumbs ups and also for subscribing it gives me a lot more motivation to really keep pressing and doing the best that I can guys to give you a bit of a chance with these subjects because I feel these subjects need you to have someone to assist you as well so that you can really 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 become limitless in terms of what you can get out of them this is not just to pass metric folks but this is a building block to a greater future because we need a whole lot of you guys to master this so that you can make our world go around much faster and to be a better place to live in we rely heavily on you guys coming through because without you there 
our lives are miserable definitely we are doomed so this is just to help those bright brains of yours to function at the highest speeds possible by trying to lessen the friction of the studying and also simplifying the approach to answering these questions i think these exams are truly not easy man they match really what you would say um higher grade in a way because most of the questions are really not straightforward they're not really easy and at times you just feel like you, you, this is unfair but it is actually fair it's just that it demands you to know your work so much more than you know yourself in fact i would just say know your work as much as you would know your friend because it's not easy to know oneself because we tend to become defensive about who we are even when we know very well that this is not who we are but we tend to be defensive and biased but our friends we know them we know what to think of them we may not know everything but you can predict your behavior i mean the behavior of your friend in given scenarios or different scenarios better than you would decide how you would react because when it's personal it's personal you know you're not becoming objective at all but when it's somebody else you tend to be objective about your judgment of their behavior and usually it's correct so i would say treat physics and maths as your friend the one person you would know how they would behave better than you would know yourself yeah anyway that's just speaking nonsense <laughs> i'm sorry guys i always talk and i love to talk but it's so late it's like 4:30 in the morning and i still have to sleep i have a very long day at work as well I just hope it doesn't become overwhelming but i'll come back in the afternoon hopefully early afternoon because my my list for tomorrow is not too long so i just pray it doesn't get lengthened by anybody trying to complicate or even the ones i'm aiming to just you know quickly quickly do uh yeah yeah that is simply that uh so i hope i just get through my list easily tomorrow so i can come back and finish up this thing so that at least you can have it you know within time before you write your chemistry otherwise guys thank you very much for your great work i can see my videos are really increasing in terms of the viewership and that means they are getting to as many people as possible which is the intention to try and spread you know the assistance it's just a, a little bit that i can do guys it's it's really nothing fancy it's nothing complete uh, it still needs more work so just use it as you know a means to an end more than an end in itself all right and i'll always be there to try my best to give as much of what i can as possible of course these videos are not really high quality at this point because i mean you can see it's just you know they are as raw as possible uh but i'll try to improve as well and try to you know be in tune with the current electronic you know options that probably simplify the work a little bit more and of course the quality also improves and then i'll try to also do this thing of dividing these videos i mean within the video to sort of create some chapters so that you don't get stuck into the whole thing you just go and zoom into what you want i'll do my best to do that as soon as possible all right guys again thank you very much and good luck with your preparations and good luck with your practice and definitely good luck when you finally do the writing i hope it all goes well because that's the intention bye bye for now see you in the next video